from Acapulco came to Manila, but not really Manila because the Spaniards first came to Cebu, diba? if you know your history. And maybe, very romantically, siguro, they threw the tops out and it grew in our tropical. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, that's uh, me thinking that. And our people uh, must have seen it maybe because theories on how people uh, wove textile, uh, one of them is maybe the fiber got loose in the water, you know, and then you make Manila hemp. And so people were weaving, you know, there was bark that they pounded so that they could make it into loincloths and in for a baby or to carry uh, stuff. Uh, it could have happened like that. So we go to Piña, which is the iconic textile of the Philippines. We are the only country in the whole wild, wide world that still produces, weaves, makes pineapple to wear. Here is an example of the fiber extracted from the pineapple. So on top you see the knotted piece of fiber, then you see the coconut, and then you see porcelain, you see manila clam, and then you see um, a clean uh, knotted fiber, a hand, I forgot to put a foot, because those are all that you use to make piña. The woman here is looking at this whole pile, this whole growth of pineapple, and you hardly see the pineapple because the leaves are about five to seven feet long, and it grows very masinsin, ano? so her hands are very tough, because she's actually looking at it from this height. She's looking at this whole mass, and she's pulling it. And then she begins to cut off both sides of the pineapple, because it's very sharp. No? So she's scraping it away from her, and the first to remove the glucose, and she's using the, um, the porcelain. So the first layer, she's taking off the glucose. And the fiber she's taking from that is called pastos. And pastos in our language is rough, uncouth, rough. The second layer, she scrapes again, and it's called liniwan. This is now the fine piña, the fine one. And she's using the coconut. And she's taking all of this, and she's putting it aside. So here's a close-up of the <coughs> liniwan and pastos fiber. It still has glucose, a lot of glucose. So she goes to a fast-flowing river, because you need, it cannot be in a faucet, cannot. It has to be in the river, believe me. And why? Because she washes the glucose out, and so the water has to be continuous, no? And she gets the manila clam, and she again scrapes the fiber one by one by one. We're talking about 100 leaves. So she's doing that in, in groups, to wash out the glucose. The fibers are hung so that the sun will uh, dry it out. After that, she gets it out again and she starts beating it to get more glucose out, more glucose. And this is done in groups. Huh? You're not talking of a machine here. Then it is stretched. The, lady, the, the woman is stretching it before she combs it. So this is the comb called hagaton, hagaton, and it is usually handmade. So the very, very fine one, can you imagine that comb being done by a, a, a smith, a metal smith, what you call that, uh, and done one by one by one. And so she's holding a palayok, and that's where she puts in the knotted fiber called tinagak. She uh, knots it using the bamboo pole, and she hangs these uh, fibers and she takes it one by one, and she knots it like that. So she cuts it. She uses a scissor, but uh, before it was a, um, a very sharp piece of uh, bamboo, very sharp, that was the scissor. When the knotter is finished, usually she, it's by with the eye, huh? and it's called pinaga. She brings it to the market, and they usually sit down there, and the weavers, come and they start haggling on how much they could, uh, this is. Now the demand is really, really strong. There's not enough um, planting of it. Not enough planting. Uh, not enough 
weaving. This is my take today of the kimona. Yeah. So this one is very expensive because it's all in hand. But look what I put here. The, these stitches are modern now. You see this? Can you see this in a barong? Nice, huh? So my people, my girls, they embroider this. Now I teach it in Laguna. This is a take on a, on a short skirt. Yeah, I wish I could wear it, but at my age, uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, this is woven. This is woven by the Itnegs. You know the Itnegs? Tingyan, up in Abra. That was also one of our livelihood. You can go and visit them, and they will weave it for you. But I also mixed it with the uh, Magindanao, Matabato. Weave here, I mixed the Itneg, and I mixed the Indian. Landap is the Muslim Mano from Maranao. Huh? Maranao is different from Cotabato. Don't get confused because the two ethnic uh, uh, people are two different people. Uh, this is a take again on that. I never throw piña away because it will just get more and more expensive. <coughs> so these are um, the little balls. So I, I taught uh, Sofa how to make the balls. In the first day, Sofa students said to me, I'm learning to make a little blouse. I said, yeah. You learn how to make a little blouse. Then you can tell the people, your workers, after how long it took you, and you know how long they will they will learn. If you don't make it yourself, you don't know. They can fool you. Mm -hmm. This is um, very fine abaca that got destroyed in the floods of Aklan. So I went to the people who, who wove it, and I saw all destroyed textiles. And I said, if you give it to me at a good price, I'll buy it. And I bought it, OK? And those who come to me and take lessons with me, we, I only want those who want to be creators, creators, who will take that to heart. And it's not only in embroidery. It's in every aspect of life. It's in every aspect of being Filipino. It's our identity as Filipino. We're the only country in the whole world. You wear something like this, you don't even have to talk. They'll know that's Filipino.